It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. What do you know about African-American religious history? Julius H. Bailey joins us in this episode to talk about his new introduction to the subject. It's a book called Down in the Valley, and the book operates on a few different levels. Its ground floor is sort of a general history that begins with African traditional religions and moves through slavery and religion, the rise of black churches and other religious movements like Islam, through the civil rights movement, and up to the present time. Another level of the book focuses on how that historical story has been told by different people at different times. This episode is about the diverse history of African-American religions and the diverse histories of that history. Send questions and comments to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes or leave some comments on Facebook or YouTube or wherever else you listen to the show. It's Julius H. Bailey on African-American religious traditions on this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're speaking today with Julius H. Bailey. He's a professor of religious studies at the University of Redlands in California. He joins us via Skype this morning. Uh, welcome to the show. Good morning. I'm excited to talk about your new book, Down in the Valley, uh, an introduction to African-American religious history. When I first hear that phrase, African-American religious history, uh, when I saw this book, my mind instantly went to Christianity in particular. And I, I think a, a lot of people, a lot of listeners are probably thinking the same thing. So I thought we should start off by talking about some of the reasons why that's the case. And I, we can obviously consider my own white middle class background, uh, but I'd also like to hear more about people like W.E.B. Du Bois and other scholars, many of them black who've kind of talked about the histories, why people think of African-American religious history as Christianity to begin with. Well, that's a great, 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 great question to start with. Um, yeah, there is this, and I guess one important thing to note, even at the outset, is just that Christianity definitely d plays an important role in African American religious history. The Black Church has played uh, an important role for in strengthening and encouraging people. And as you mentioned, W. B. Du Bois and others have talked about the power of, of sort of African American worship services, observing them during slavery or in the South, and how powerful it is for to have a kind of a black preaching style and the call and response and the gospel music and it has such a profound impact on American culture. So I definitely want to acknowledge that for sure. And even a few years ago, if you're going to take a class in college, they might have called it the black church, not even black churches. Uh, so definitely that's a definitely a central part of African American religious history. So yeah, and so part of what the book tries to do is to acknowledge that important history, but also to look at the diversity of African American religious history, because it is very diverse, it's not only Christianity, there's Islam has played an important role, there have been a number of black new religious movements that have emerged in America, um, and, and the African history has, uh, religious traditions have played an important role in influencing traditions like voodoo and Santeria and those kind of traditions as well. And so part of it too is one reason I've called it African American religious history is to broaden that out a little bit to go that it's not just black church history, although it's a part of the book for sure, but to also think about the diversity of African American religious history and the variety of traditions that make that up. You start the book off with W.E.B. Du Bois and his research in African American worship service. Introduce people to him a little bit and what he was after. Yeah, well, W. Du Bois, clearly a profound thinker and um, Harvard scholar and one of the first to really take seriously African-American religious traditions. And so for him, it was, and I was always struck by his observations of when he saw this sort of, this religious service in the backwoods, and he talked about the frenzy that took place and the call and response um, that he saw. And he was like, what is this this thing that I've seen? He's trying to put wrap his mind around it. And he tried to get at that that dynamic of what does it mean to... What is this, what's different about African-American religious history, African-American religious services? And so for him, it was partly going back to that sort of early southern roots, drawing back to Africa in some cases. But there's something about being nurtured in the south and the oppression of slavery that produces a particular kind of religious expression that African-Americans express through spirituals and the sort of emotion and movement of the services. And so part of his ch challenge was to try to figure out what is this all about and try to study what's distinctive about African-American religious traditions from other traditions like European-American or other traditions in America. One of the things that you call attention to through his studies also is this idea of 
American religious history being framed uh, in terms of declension is the term that you use. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and so I think Du Bois does it as well. I guess just point this sort of tendency of sort of always pointing back towards a glorious age, sort of something previously that that happened. So for Du Bois, coming from in a, in a northern, northeastern American context, he looks back at the South as like, oh, wow, this is the moment where it was authentic worship and is not as sort of um, professional and uh, measured as something like the Fist Jubilee Singers, this sort of an opera troupe that travels around the country. Um, and so he's like, well, there's there's that, but there's something authentic about this Southern experience in the South and oppression, this sort of untouched moment in the backwoods in the Southern territories in America, that sort of the authentic black culture. And then for others, they go, oh, no, it was in Africa where there's sort of this authentic African religious tradition and it declines over time the further you get away from Africa. And as more and more generations are born in America and further away from that African tradition, some have said, well, that's less authentic. And so the sort of constant moving of, of, the, of the dynamic, I use the, the Puritans as an example as well, they had a similar thing. Each generation sort of felt like the world was getting worse, that the previous generation was more authentic or more, de more devoted or more faithful to their tradition. And so you sort of see that in Puritan culture as well, the second generation trying to live up to that first generation of John Winthrop and the others. And I sort of saw that similar dynamic in African-American religion, and even among scholars as well, is always sort of pointing backwards, that African-American religion is not necessarily getting better, right? It's always the past as a glorious age, and not just for African-American religion, but sort of see that tendency in American religious history as well, that things are always better in the past as sort of the, the gold standard. I thought that was a really important part of the book was just sort of talking about how these studies of African-American religious history really are representative of um, of these wider studies that you talk about the Puritans and sort of this look toward the nostalgic past. I really like that a lot. And in talking about that also, the idea of boundaries in general, uh, and there's sort of a condescending question that, that will come up sometimes where people will say, uh, you know, a study on African American religious history, well, where's the Caucasian uh, American religious history sort of thing? And do you encounter that at all? And if, 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 if you do, how do you usually respond? Yeah, for sure. There's definitely that dynamic of well, why why is there even a need for African American religion, or or what do we do with religious traditions that have a racial or ethnic marker at the beginning of their tradition? So African American religion, Native American traditions, you might hear, but as you mentioned, people don't necessarily talk about Caucasian religion or white religion or the white church tradition or something. And so one answer is that generally speaking, in Amer terms of American studies of American religious history, um, there are many many white churches or other traditions are seen as the mainstream so yeah. there's not even a they're sort of normalized so that normal christian religion is white mainstream you know baptist methodist stuff and everything else is sort of uh on the margins or sort of has to make a case for being included in that narrative and so um so i think in that way that the sort of privilege that comes with being able to just say talk about mainstream evangelical tradition in america and it's sort of understood that that means white mainstream uh, traditions in America. And so for me, part of it is try to wrestle with that question as to why, why are certain traditions um, have that sort of racial or ethnic marker? Or what do I mean by African-American religious traditions? Who, who constitutes African-American? What do I mean by that? And so traditionally, that's been traditions that have of people of African descent that emerge from primarily African-American religious traditions like the black baptist church tradition or right. the black ame and so part of what i do is well if you're talking about african american religious history maybe we should also include members of traditions that aren't necessarily primarily uh, majority african american so what about members of african americans who stayed as presbyterians or identified as roman catholic why would they be less a part of that narrative than groups that emerge from within the tradition and this is a powerful part of the book is the idea that it really explodes the stereotypes about about there being a singular black religious experience. And what kind of factors contributed to that assumption that there was this the black church, the black religious experience? And, and how did you hope to address them in, in such a short overview? Sure. And it's a really a difficult question because oftentimes I'll have students as part of my classes will go to an African-American church and so experience it firsthand. And even today, just like Du Bois, it's, again, not all African-American traditions, right? There's lots of variety, and some are more sort of um, cerebral or more sort of um, conservative in their approach to worship, others more uh, emotional or more um, ecstatic in their worship. So there's definitely diversity. 
But there is something striking that if you went to, generally speaking, a, a, a tradition of a different ethnic group and then went to an African American service, you would say, wow, there's something really distinctive about it. And so there's something like I want to put my finger, so wrap my mind around what's distinctive about it. But how do you do that without necessarily, you know, invoking a bunch of stereotypes like I almost just did? Like, how do you talk about a black preaching style that's distinctive without then setting up a kind of normalized black style that then if an African-American preacher doesn't perform that way, then somehow they're less African-American or they're less at the core of that authentic tradition, however it's framed. And so, yeah, it's that really a really difficult dynamic. And so what I try to do is try to walk that line between talking about, yes, generally speaking, there are some general characteristics that many, if not most African-American churches will likely exhibit if you went there today and how they change over time historically, but to also somehow acknowledge that diversity to say, wait a minute, but they're not all that way. And so what do we do with that, or with these traditions that don't fit those particular traditions? And it seems unfair. It seems like historically many studies will sort of ex- either exclude them from the narrative or just sort of talk about how they're, um, um, you know, really conservative or somehow not, like the colored method Episcopal Church gets this a lot, that there's some they're, they're conservative politically and they kept the term colored and so they're sort of, and many people at the time in the 19th century would call them like a bootleg organization or you're just a sellout or Uncle Tom's. Yeah. And to me, I think that's such a problematic way to, to talk about difference and we can't replicate in their scholarship. I think we have to continue to try to find a language to acknowledge both the sort of the general characteristics that many churches hold while also saying, well, wow, what do we do with this diversity? And there's a way to talk about, yeah, they're just as a part, much a part of the tradition. They're not less, tra- they're not less African American because they're conservative in their pr- approach. And we'll see that that kind of plays out throughout the book. I think there's a there's kind of a subplot to the book it, because it's an introduction to African American religious history. I also detected an, an undercurrent of addressing religious studies in general and how different scholars will tell different stories based on different questions they ask, based on different assumptions that they bring. And you, I think, do a good job of reviewing the literature from the past on research on the African American religious history. So I really liked how you. Uh, brought that in. So it serves to introduce people to African American religious history, but also to different perspectives, I think, within religious studies to call attention to the fact that religious studies is a conversation and not a declaration. For sure. And that's part of, and again, I'm not, I don't want to say that my book is the comprehensive, you know, the final study. (laughs) It's the one, man. Go for it. (laughs) (laughs) But but it is, like you said, like you said, is is to find a way to, to try to pull all these threads together, or at least to raise the questions that like, like you mentioned earlier, why why do we talk about a – we wouldn't talk about a white church, but we would feel comfortable talking about a black church as a category even though there's all this diversity. And so part of it is to talk about um, the ways that scholars talk about why is uh, is Christianity the sort of the main narrative when there is clearly – you know, current research talks about how, how important Islam was to, to many slaves, and they found that just as empowering. Or how do we sort of deal with these narratives that um, that have these very interesting creation narratives that some would call them as sort of these um, these myths that are created that talk about a glorious African past without necessarily having a lot of the the sort of historical data to back it up? How do we talk about myth or um, or slave religion and and the sort of ways things change over time? Uh, is to find ways to acknowledge that that diversity. Uh, and to raise the question. So I think the book tries to raise more questions maybe than it answers, but it's to talk about why do we assume that slaves have this particular dynamic or why is the the narrative of Christianity such a strong pull? Like why does that – why have scholars found that to be a kind of satisfactory narrative? And so part of me is, is, is raising these questions. Of what do we do with, with groups that don't fit that model or groups that choose not to – move to independent African-American churches in the 19th century, but choose to stay in there in the white, predominantly white Methodist church. What do we do with those experiences? And I think those should be just as a part of the narrative as well. That's Julius H. Bailey. We're talking about his new book, Down in the Valley, an introduction to African-American religious history. I wanted to go now to the Middle Passage. For those who aren't familiar with the terminology, this will take us to a point in history, kind of a a big turning point that sets the stage for African-American religious history. So take a a moment for people who aren't familiar with with the terminology here to talk about what the Middle Passage is. Yeah, well, the Middle Passage is a term that um, scholars have coined to talk about the 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 ship voyage from the the enslavement of Africans primarily in the west uh, coast of Africa and that middle passage on the ship that could take depending on the destination between three to six months in some cases 
uh, to arrive to either South America or North America, wherever the, the final uh, point of debar- debarkation was. Um, and so part of it is that is that moment. And so for many scholars, it's this question of what impact did this this voyage have? Because you have people, you know, ripped from their culture, packed tightly into these ships, chained, you know, side by side, having very little to eat, very little water to drink, um, you know, abuse in some cases, people who died just being thrown overboard. And so sickness, all this sort of terrible experience, this horrific experience on this uh, on the ship voyage. And so what part of what many scholars have wrestled with is, well, how do we think about this experience? And so for some, uh, one scholar famous, E. Franklin Frazier, uh, a sociologist, really made the case that this voyage was so traumatic that it basically caused African Americans to lose all of their culture in Africa, that it was so tra- that sort of traumatic experience. So that when they arrived in America, they basically were a blank slate, that there wasn't, they didn't have much of African culture. And so when we think about African American religious history or the formation of African religious culture, that people then sort of, sort of built it from the, the context of oppression in America. So the story of African American religious history really starts on the shores of the early colonies. While someone like Melville J. Herskovitz, another scholar, makes an anthropologist, makes an argument that no, well, in fact, that while the Middle Passage was traumatic and this horrific experience, that out of that trauma, Africans would have held even more tightly to their culture. So to think about African American religious history is really a story about the transformation of what primarily West African religious culture, so that for Herskovitz, you could see uh, sort of preaching styles or the way that people spoke in Africa seeing those same kind of motions in black preaching styles or the dances of many West West African religious traditions. You could see that in African American religious traditions in America. While for E. Franklin Frazier, he, again, he maintained that idea that, that, that while it might look similar, that it's really more about the ways that African Americans created something in America and wouldn't necessarily go back to, um, to an African culture that things originated from. Yeah, Herskovitz and Fraser kind of set up a, a dynamic that would be debated um, for a really long time. This idea of was it just completely built from the ground up because of this complete break with the past? Was it uh, something that's transformed? What survived? How to tell? What kind of sources uh, are historians working with as they debate these types of questions? Sure, and that that and that that even I guess even the what sources are count I guess is a is a um, is sort of this typical ongoing debate. So for someone like Hers- Fre- uh, for Herskovitz, uh, he almost had like a feel for things. So he'd go, well, you know, wow, I don't really have a, you know, I don't know how, I can't track that. Yes, this culture from West Africa came to, you know, South Carolina and performed this particular dance. But when he saw the ring shout and the way that people moved, he goes, wow, that's so reminiscent of cultures like Yoruba in, uh, in Africa. It looks so similar that there must be some connection. So for Herskovitz, it was almost an observational kind of thing that he could look at cross cultures and see that there's a connection, even if you couldn't necessarily substantiate a clear sort of historical records linking those. Uh, while someone from like Fraser and others, um, the question is really more about you really need to sort of, and now they have these great slave trade databases where they've, mm-hmm. they've you know, documented these slave voyages. And so for others, it's like, well, no, if you want to make an assertion about South Carolina, you need to find the ways, so the, the ship, the way that it traveled, and then track the way those slaves were then sold, place, you know, go through all the slave records, locate them in a particular city in South Carolina, and then you could talk about a comparative dynamic between sort of what survived in South Carolina and what came from uh, something like Nigeria or something. So that'd be much more concrete. And so even the what counts as sources or what's persuasive is even part of the de- debate. And probably not surprisingly, depending on where you fall, you the records tend to shake out the way that you uh, that supports your presumption. So, um, so Herskovitz, yeah, for sure, is is much more um, open minded when it comes to the retention of African culture. It's funny because in a way, I'm more drawn to Herskovitz's sort of conclusions that he's reaching, but also you know, looking at Fraser's more analytical approach that seems more disciplined and and seeing that as a better practice while i'm saying like i like this guy's conclusions but this guy's methods a little bit more (laughs) the story that a lot of americans grow up with we're already confronting here is this america was founded as a nation where freedom of religion alongside other things uh, would be championed this is an especially acute area where african-american religious history complicates that simplistic narrative on the one hand we have 18th century Great Awakening stories, uh, 
with instances of interracial harmony, uh, black people worshiping alongside white people and vice versa. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the obvious uh, issue of slavery. So how do you approach these tensions in the book? Yeah, there's definitely that, that tension, as you mentioned, the, the narrative of, and many books on American religious, religious history, sort of the canon, will talk about how freedom and as being this sort of this key dynamic in understanding religion in America and how, like, the Great Awakening as a time when um, that, that sort of freedom that comes from uh, religious worship and a more expressive emphasis on a sort of heart and emotion versus sort of head knowledge and um, long theological training or something – that that some have argued that it's that the the freedom of the Great Awakenings that actually leads to the that notion of freedom that leads to the push for independence and those sorts of issues and so part of the challenge of African American religion is where does that fit in the narrative because what does freedom mean for people who come to America not voluntarily but you know in chains and they come to America um, and they're you know oppressed and they're you know they're enslaved and treated as property. And so how do we think about this theme of freedom? And so really, in, in many ways, uh, African-American religions really challenge that. So as even as African-Americans are created in Christianity, many white Christian traditions have to wrestle with this question of, well, what does that mean? If, my, if I baptize my slave, then do they become free like us? What does that mean? What does religious freedom mean in a context where people don't have actual lived freedom and social and economic freedom in America. And so you have them, you sort of track these laws in the 18th and 19th century, and it's just so striking as many states like Virginia begin to make a distinction between uh, religious freedom and civic freedom, so that they pass these laws that say, yes, you're baptized and you're religiously free and it's going to be great, but that, that religious baptism doesn't have any impact on your day-to-day -day life. You're still a slave. And so as you see, people like Frederick Douglass will make a distinction between slaveholding Christianity and what he calls true Christianity because there's just sort of this, this sort of um, this seeming hypocrisy that slaves see of, of master that beats them six days a week, attends church, uh, and they're seen as these great people. And so part of it is this sort of wrestling with. And so I think in many cases, African-American religious history are African-Americans trying to advance their own agency and trying to assert a kind of freedom um, and sort of pushing America and calling America that Martin Luther King Jr. would do, you know, many years later of calling them to account on these sort of questions of freedom. Like you say, it's a free country, but what does that mean? Or you say that Christianity is a, is a religion of, of empowerment and freedom and to, you know, to be empowered in Christ. But then what does that mean if that is not going to have any impact on your day to day life? You still have to um, you still have to work for the master. You're still not being able to um, to work for your own well-being and your own happiness. And so I think that then sort of see that played out over time with Reconstruction and calls to to go back to Africa when there's just sort of calling America to account. And so in that period after the Civil War, there is that moment again where African Americans go, wow, we're going to have this freedom that people have asked us, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, we're going to have this freedom, America's going to live up to its dream. Um, Reconstruction ends, all this sort of violence in the South, and African Americans again are sort of discouraged and trying to figure out what's going on. about. And again, that sort of rise of a back to Africa movement, sort of that maybe would they need to lead the country in order to live up to that freedom. And so you sort of see this sort of recurrent pattern in American, relig American and African American religious history of African Americans asserting a kind of freedom, in some cases getting some advances, but then when those doors get shut, um, trying to figure out what's next. And so you sort of see that, that sort of recurrent dynamic over and over uh, throughout American, African American religious history. And it really plays out in kind of identity in terms of you talk frequently about this relationship between the African identity and the American identity and that for a long time um, scholars have tried to or have understood these as sort of opposing forces um, but you propose a, a different way to approach it the idea of, of hybrid so on the one hand we have African-American religious studies that's looking for African retentions what can we identify in African religious uh, African-American religious worship that looks like something that came over uh, through the Middle Passage. Then there's studies that look at the evolution. Okay, how did it change through time? You you propose a, a hybrid, looking at a hybridization process. Yeah, and again, it's it an attempt to sort of think about, because there's this tendency to, as you mentioned, that to work in binaries when it comes to African American religious history. I'm not, not quite sure why that's the case. And so it's often, the you think about slave religion, it's either Nat Turner, the rebellious slave, who takes up arms against the um, the oppressive white infrastructure, uh, or there's the Uncle Tom who's just happy about the way things are going, or there's the 
the field slave or there's the house slave or there's um, W.B. Du Bois or Booker T. Washington being more conservative and W. Du Bois asserting a more um, forceful call for um, for civil rights. And so this sort of tendency to, to, to do the binary. And so part of what I try to think of this sort of this hybridization approach is, again, try to think about the complexities of culture and identity that maybe that people aren't static entities. It's not like that, you know, that Martin Luther King Jr. held the same position his entire life or Malcolm X and it was unchanging. Like people are like people today. We are complex and we're, our thoughts change over time and we don't necessarily hold to exact positions as we mature or grow or encounter different ideas that challenge what we previously thought. And so part of what I thought is this hybridization um, model is to think about, well, maybe there's a way to think about rather than sort of African or European or even W. Du Bois' idea of a double consciousness, sort of that struggle between the American and, and African sides, is to think about it as, well, maybe there's just almost like this, uh, a range that, that people draw on different sort of cultural elements depending on the situation, and they change over time. And so to think about, rather than thinking about, sometimes people will contrast Martin Luther King Jr. with Malcolm X, and you know, Malcolm X radical, Martin Luther King Jr. has the sort of more conservative approach, but then if you sort of track their careers, you, kind of, you can almost make an argument that toward the end of their lives that Malcolm X was more conservative in terms of his approach and the sort of Muslim organization that he founded versus uh, Martin Luther King Jr. advocating for uh, the poor people's movement and advocating for all these things beyond just uh, racial um, civil rights as well. And so part of what I do is maybe we, if we can sort of move out of the binaries that maybe there's other kinds of questions that would um, that would emerge if we stop thinking if, if people didn't fit so clearly neatly into each of these boxes if we make the boundaries of those boxes a little fuzzier that maybe there is a sort of a, a greater complexity or underlying questions that might emerge in our study of african-american religious history and again that just speaks to the strength of, of an introductory book like this because not only does it complicate people's simplistic views of american history but it also complicates histories of of african-american religious history uh, more specifically as well and you talked about some of the contrasting figures that are often focused on and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go let's talk west africa traditional religions this is your opening chapter it gives us an overview of some of the religions that came through the middle passage and that weren't completely overridden or, or sort of taken in by Christianity. Here's a quote from you. You say, African religions were transported to the Americas in the hearts and minds of captured slaves, despite harsh conditions and often stringent laws designed to strip away cultural and religious connections to their homeland. What are a few examples of, of religion that was brought over? Yeah, um, there's a number of, of, of West African traditions. And I think that's, um, again, one of the challenges, again, I don't want to uh, I want to first acknowledge the virtue of West African traditions and don't want to um, suggest that there's one way of approaching it. That even in looking at it, there's this huge area of West Africa, even using that as a, a context, and even at the local level, so much diversity. Uh, but many of the traditions um, that come through, such as the Yoruba, have a um, certain markers that, that, that are characteristic of many of the traditions, Not maybe not all of West African religious traditions, but most of them have a, like in the Yoruba tradition, have a high god, or will have divinities that have specific areas of influence that they're focused on, or spirit sort of lesser divinities that are below the the high god who might be the is usually a central figure or who does um, often is responsible for creation of the earth and other elements of nature, uh, a medicine person, drums, rituals, music being really important, and so these are some of the the markers that many West African traditions hold, and so. I guess as you sort of see in the, the chapter that I sort of lean Herskovitz, right? Because I do say mm -hmm. it comes in the, the hearts and minds of, of individuals. And again, it's difficult because, again, many of the times when we're, we're trying to observe early slave culture, that many times, since Africans can't record in their own journals what happened, oftentimes what people are looking at are, um, are sort of white observers of what, well, this is this, this, um, what this person likely came from. I think I think some of the more interesting sources are, are like bill of sales, where people apparently would have a call for. Uh, in in some cases, certain African religious traditions would sp have, I guess, skills in certain agricultural pr products, or were believed to be good housekeepers. Again, very stereotypical stuff, but that people would have these bill of sales and would talk about uh, this medingo from this particular location. And so, part of what that does, at least, gives us an idea that. Uh, yes, there are people of the Mandingo culture in these particular areas of the South, uh, 
And so again, maybe not get to the place where Fraser would want us to have this exact mapping routes, but it does at least give us a sense that there are these West African traditions and people apparently are still self-identifying with whatever ethnic group that they came from Africa from. And so at least a starting point to talk about, yeah, well, there might be definitely just diversity within the traditions, but it does seem like many of these West African traditions were still uh, apparently practiced by many of the slaves who came and were imported to America in the, in the 17th century. What kind of measures were taken to suppress that religion? And did people openly say, we've got to, we got to squelch this culture just out of existence here? Yeah, and again, there are different approaches, but in many cases where there was this, and again, scholars debate, go back and forth, uh, but on, on the one hand, some have argued that, that what they call the seasoning process when they arrived in America was that some have argued that, that in, many, in many, many of the early colonies, that people actually actively tried to move like a mandingo away from a wolof or something, and that so actively tried to separate people from their culture so they wouldn't have that ability to communicate and then would somehow would have rebellions that would take place because they were able to sort of communicate and identify as an African uh, sort of solidarity. And so some have argued that, that many in the South actually played up ethnic identity to try to keep Africans from uniting um, and sort of trying to overthrow the whole system of slavery. So there's that one. I mean, how would they even know that recognize the religious practice of a, of, of a traditional African religion? Yeah, no, and that's a great point. And so I guess in terms of legislation, so laws against reading, for sure, laws against African Americans meeting in larger groups than five after sunset, right, very monitored kinds of things. And so, which again is pretty striking because on the one hand, you have this narrative of these Africans are property, they're not really people, they're inferior. Yeah. But on the other hand, you're taking all of these restrictions because it seems like if you really think these folks are inferior, you'd be like, try to teach them all day to read. They won't be able to read. Yeah. But it sounds like there's this under this sort of even then that early period, this really conflicted reading or conflicted narrative of saying, yes, these folks are property and they're inferior, but we also have to restrict what they do. It, almost as if there's a way that religion can almost sort of see the power of religion, that if you let a bunch of Africans meet together and really start praying or doing their traditional practices, that that's going to be an empowering thing. So it seems like it's almost a an awareness that we have to limit their religious stuff and keep it, even though they're sort of using this narrative of, of property. And so that's what's really striking. And so what um, in, the, like, in Al Rabato's book on slave religion, uh, The Invisible Institution, he makes his argument that that Africans actually stole away and were uh, had this secret practice that they focused on uh, in their tradition. And so that they really um, worked to sort of to have their religion thrive and be empowered by it because the masters themselves gave them this narrative of, of slaves be obedient to your master. So all the narratives that they received, particularly in a Christian context, was to was religion as kind of a means of control and to to obey your master. And so uh, there's this whole other practice of slaves risking their lives to in hush harbors or out in the woods to practice their own traditions in the way that they saw fit, and in many cases melding Christianity to that religion as well for empowerment. So there's sort of these two, uh, this sort of the sort of the public nature of African religion, and this sort of private narrative that trying to get at what does it mean for these private worship services that took place. That it's such a fascinating part of the book and tragic and just uh, I mean. It's just so, so interesting to read these stories of here you have uh, slave masters and people that are putting these sort of restrictions on on slaves. Uh, don't they can't be taught to read. They can't gather together and this sort of thing. But we're also going to try to Christianize them. We're also going to evangelize them. And some people would use that as a justification for slavery to begin with. Like, oh, we're doing them a favor. We're bringing them into the to this true faith. You know, other people understood Christianity as a way to just mollify and pacify uh, people who would otherwise want to rebel or, or, or um, escape. And so you also point out how demographics ended up playing a huge role in this story because of these dynamics. So Puritan New England had an African pop population of about 3%. South Carolina by 1750 was over 60% African. Fa in, in the face of these types of dynamics, uh, you have some populations where you have more than half the population is, is African. How did, how did demographics play into Christianizing of slaves? 
Sure. And again, that's part of my, my narrative of just this diversity, even if, as you mentioned, African-American religious history, that really that geographics matter, demographics matter. So in a place like Puritan New England, where there's, you know, like you mentioned, a very small percent, 3 percent of the population um, in the 18th century, the mid 18th century being uh, such a small population that you don't have the same kind of questions. There are issues like where will my slave be buried, right? And so this question about well, should my slave be buried, should we have a separate black cemetery, yeah. uh, will you know Africans be in heaven with me, those kind of issues. And then in South Carolina where it's almost 60 percent African Americans, a whole different dynamic where you have these large populations of African Americans, really difficult to supervise, and it's there that you see a number of rebellions that, that take place. Uh, well, Virginia was around 40 percent, I believe. That's where Nat Turner's rebellion took place, and Gabriel Prosser, and then um, in South Carolina, a number of rebellions as well. And so this sort of question about the retention of African culture, when you have these sort of large populations um, that, that extend, you see um, a much more, it seems like money more, like in the, the Goa Islands of South Carolina, a much stronger retention of language and particular rituals from, from West Africa that you can see there. And so it really does, and sort of the anxiety of whites in, in South Carolina with 60%, this sort of presumably, you know, being outnumbered that any moment these folks, you know, gather together, they really could do uh, sort of overthrow things. And so you sort of see that anxiety and this and these debates about well, what impact is Christianity going to have? If we Christianize the slaves, will that actually make them more likely to rebel because they'll see this religious freedom? Or if we give them a message of slaves be obedient to your master, will that actually make slaves m more controllable? Make it, does religion make people docile? And you sort of see these kind of arguments amongst different missionaries and amongst different Christian groups is what impact will Christianity have and you see that even so as African Americans begin to form their own churches in the 19th century AME Church, AME Zion, Black Baptist churches, all these churches being formed, this again that sort of ongoing question about well if we we don't really want them in our churches a whole bunch but if we leave them unsupervised then what's going to happen in those churches and so you see this really difficult tension about well what impact is religion going to have on these on this African population and many and for many African Americans they're clearly seeing it as a way to empower power themselves and one of the really striking parts of of history of being able to see through what they saw as hypocrisy of a master who you know treated them very poorly beat them were very vicious but then saw themselves as good Christians be able to see beyond that message to go well there's a whole nother message of Jesus as the second Moses that's going to um, you know rescue us from our oppression or Jesus has this this sympathetic friend who's or close brother who knows what you're going through because he rescued the Israelites. He knows that he's going to rescue us as well from slavery. So the power of being able to take that theology that was meant to oppress African Americans and for them to turn that to something to actually empower them is for me one of my just sort of remarkable points in history to sort of see that reworking of that dynamic. To me, it's just amazing. Yeah, this is where we see a lot like um, spirituals, music coming into play, where the images that are used in the songs that slaves sang stand in marked contrast to the sort of religious images that some white Christians would draw on, where there would be a focus in some white Christian dominations on repentance and salvation through Christ. In in these spiritual songs, are about stealing away, about being um, being set uh, put made free, about uh, you know these types of ideas. It's very interesting, different types of Christianity that grow out of these markedly different circumstances. Sure. And yeah, and again, so much variety. You have the African Methodist Episcopal Church that could be a little bit more formal. You have Black Baptist traditions, a little bit more expressive, or the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, a little bit more conservative in their polity. They don't necessarily want to get involved in politics and those kind of issues. And so uh, so much diversity, and again, how do we how do we sort of read the those um, those narratives and even spirituals? Is again this really complicated uh, dynamic, as you mentioned, the, the the song "Steal Away," right? All of these narratives, and so uh, as people have noted, and in the book I go through how there's all these multiple these double meanings or multiple meanings that these these songs have. And so on the one hand, you might watch African Americans singing and go, "Wow, they're so content, they're so happy, they're singing about the stealing away or about the afterlife." Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, they have these other messages about steal away. We're going to steal away to the north, and we're running away tonight to to leave the master, right? And so, sort yeah. of, and so we have this really subversive message as well. And so, how do we read these? This sort of public, private dynamic, and how do we how do we look at these really complicated um, 
spirituals and complicated musical devices that are functioning on all these different levels. And then you start to see denominations actually dividing and splitting. Uh, talk a, a little bit about that um, as, as more and more uh, blacks were becoming Christian, some would become preachers, there were questions about the propriety of that and those sort of things. So all these questions start cropping up that caused some denominations to split. Sure. Yeah, and for sure, there's uh, early on there's um, black Baptist churches that emerge in the late 18th century, and then the African Methodist Episcopal Church emerges in 1860 and 16. And there's that uh, that dramatic I talk about in the book as well that sort of dramatic moment when African Americans are in this uh, white Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, and they are um, in the late 1800s and or late 18th century, and they're um, the section that used to sit in is, is there's construction going on, and so they can't sit there, and they keep getting moved to these different locations, until finally prayer starts, and so they just kneel down in the in the white section just to pray because the prayer has started, and all these ushers come and pull the African Americans off their knees, say you can't kneel here, you got to go, you can't be in this section with the the white congregants, and uh, Richard Allen and others have that famous statement of just saying. Uh, we said, just let us finish praying, and then um, we'll leave the church, and you won't be bothered with us again. And so that powerful moment of just saying that there's just a point where you just can't, you want to worship the way you want to worship, you do, that sort of frustration of when racial dynamics are impacting your spiritual life and your existence in church and how your, uh, your life is there. And there's just a point where many African Americans go, well, we just have to find a place that this isn't too important to just be segregated in these churches. We need to have our own place. We need to have our own preachers. We have our need our own churches, our own sort of dynamics so that we can worship in the way that we want to. And so you see that emerging over and over with the uh, AME Church in 1816. A few years later, the AME Zion Church emerges, uh, the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, right? All these different churches emerging out of that. Uh, and again, the narrative is, is, in many cases, this independent black church movement, which, again, is really important. African Americans asserting a kind of uh, agency and wanting to worship in the way that they want to worship. But again, it's like, well, what do we do with those groups that don't say? What about those African Americans that go, no, actually, I'm empowered by remaining in this predominantly white church. What do we do with those? And oftentimes, they're sort of excluded from the narrative. Like, it's more about this sort of independent, and it's a powerful narrative. But part of what I want to do is go, well, what about African Americans who are empowered by Roman Catholic churches? or by Presbyterian, or who stayed in these churches. And so part of what I do in the book is to try to diversify that narrative, to definitely acknowledge this important moment, moment historically where African Americans are asserting an independence, but is, is, there, is there also a kind of power in staying in the churches that you're in? Or how do we, how do we address those particular narratives as well? Um, the place of women also comes up in these conversations too, and I think it's easy to um, project back. Uh, it's easy to look at some of these early figures as being progressive in the way that we in the way that people think of progressivism today so if a church wants to be uh, sort of more open to a, a diverse array of voices um, then we would expect that, that it would look the same but but the place of women in some of these churches remained uh, traditional in the sense of of women uh, questions about whether women should be preaching or, or be ordained and these types of things yes and, and it's, it's really striking because you might think historically because african-american men had just experienced being in african-american women as well being segregated in churches not being able to preach um, in some cases white ministers wouldn't pick up african-american babies to to baptize them or have or african-americans having to wait till all the white congregants took communion till they could take communion and so all these really difficult dynamics and so you might expect that when african-americans form their own black churches right ame churches we finally have a voice they're going to set things up that african-american men took the leadership roles uh, that many of you sort of compare the the official doctrines and statements of the different traditions uh, the AME church doctrine is pretty close to the ME church. I mean, they change like whether choirs could wear robes and some other minor changes, but no changes to that patriarchal narrative of men being in front and women should be in the home or women should teach children and all these prescriptions, at least at least initially, it's pretty striking. Initially, when the churches are formed out of a movement, there is some more flexibility. So you have these accounts of black women preaching and coming uh, to revivals and having these sort of greater roles. But when the African Methodist Episcopal Church and other churches, black Baptist churches as well, uh, begin to put in their official doctrines, they begin to replicate that patriarchal structure, which again is, 
maybe shouldn't be that surprising, but to me it's pretty surprising that you would think if African American men had just experienced not being able to preach, had experienced the pain of being, you know, not able to, you know, practice what they felt God was calling them to do, uh, that they would have a little bit more open structure for women. But in many cases, it was uh, pretty much the same. The African American women weren't, they were allowed to take a doctrine so they could get up and speak briefly, but they couldn't be preachers. They couldn't, you know, have be pastors and hold their own, you know, congregations. Uh, missionary work, they had to be accompanied by their husbands if they had one, so the uh, black women couldn't do missionary work. And so in some cases, like Amanda Smith, uh, she wanted to do missionary work. She wasn't married. She actually went to white churches, and they allowed her to do mi the missionary work that she wanted uh, to do. And so it's a really striking dynamic, because I, yeah, I think you might expect historically that African Americans would be more open to gender stuff, but even, um, even African American men who ex had just experienced oppression a few years earlier, or at least a restriction in their ways that they could practice their religious tradition, they uh, basically replicate that same kind of, of, of framing women's roles in a very narrow way in their traditions as well. And then we also kind of see um, African American missionaries back to Africa. This is sort of uh, uh, some movement that begins in this direction. What's, what's a little bit about the story there? Yeah, and I mentioned a little bit earlier this, um, you know, the when things are sort of harsh in America, this sort of political climate doesn't seem very welcoming to African Americans. There are these sort of return movements that occur. And again, lots of diversity. So there are those uh, like Paul Cuffey who, who wanted to return to Africa. Others that want to set up a kind of trade route between parts of America and Africa to try to establish a kind of black owned um, economic foundation based on a kind of some trade routes between uh, trade relationship between Africa and America, and others who want to go, um, particularly sort of missionary work, see sort of called to that God wants them to go to Africa uh, and to uh, provide missionary work to to the uh, to Africans. And so you have all these different dynamics going on, these different moments. Even the American Colonization Society in the early 19th century, uh, again out of sort of U.S. government had this plan to get rid of what they call the quote Negro problem is to get you know just let's just send all these Africans back like they're the problem and so once that happens African Americans go at least in many cases say wait a minute we're not going anywhere if you're trying to get rid of us then we want to stay and so we have this really complicated dynamic uh, between African Americans in Africa and even with missionaries going back this idea of and back to your earlier question about the middle passage many Africans Americans trying to figure out well, why would a just God have allowed slavery? And so many would have all these different answers to that question. But one is that if if it's that he brought us to America so that we'd experience Christianity and now we can go back and Christianize Africa. And again, all kinds of problems with that kind of assumption. You know, Afri you know Christianity has been in Africa for centuries, right? Yeah. And and so this sort of idea, but you sort of see that question of, well, how do you how do you just this horrific thing that happened to us as a people for many African Americans? How do you make sense of that? And in the 19th century, for some, it was, well, maybe God has a, given us this Christian message because we're um, that it's our it's our, our our destiny to go back and to Christianize these quote heathen Africans. And again, this really complicated dynamic of comparing sort of African American missionaries to white missionaries. And the narratives about Africans are pretty close. Heathens, right? They don't have any culture. They're uncivilized. And so what do we do with this dynamic of African Americans going back, having this fairly stereotypical and in many cases negative view of Africans, but at the same time loving Africa? So this sort of difficult dynamic of they love this romantic nose of Africa and going back, but not super thrilled about Africans themselves. And in, 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 in internalizing a lot of the the sort of science, pseudo-scientific rhetoric of the time that African Americans are better suited for the harsh climate because of their African roots, like they can sort of connect. And many missionaries expecting an almost um, welcoming party, hey, welcome back to Africa, right? <laughs> and so this really difficult to deal with all these different, this complex relationship with Africa, that on one hand, this really powerful symbol that many Africans draw upon, but also really embracing many of the sort of dark continent negative stereotypes of Africa as well. That's Julius H. Bailey. He's a professor of religious studies at the University of Redlands in California. And we're talking about his latest book, Down in the Valley, an introduction to African-American religious history. Julius, this also kind of ties into uh, the next topic, which is new religious movements. And, and some of these are 
wound up in discussions about whether to return to Africa or what the place of an African American is today. So I thought it would be interesting for you to give us a quick overview from Marcus Garvey up to the Nation of Islam. These are non-Christian traditions, uh, African American religious examples. Sure. And again, this is again part of that diversity of African American religious history that so often that sort of Christian centered narrative. But we have all these groups emerging in the 19th and early 20th century that have a really different take on on what African or African American religious identity is. And again, it often goes back to that question, that harshness of the Middle Passage, the impact of slavery on African American culture. And so some as well, who am I? What is our identity? And so because of the lack of resources to go, well, I'm actually a Wolof, or I was, I was from the Yuba culture, without having that exact uh, specifics about where you're from, you see this emergence of these really interesting 19th century new religious movements where they try to answer that question, well, who am I? My culture's been taken from me. And so for many, uh, so for Marcus Garvey, it is as a response to that sort of earlier stuff I talked about, that negative view of African culture in some cases, that uh, Marcus Garvey says, wait a minute, if African Americans want to advance that as, as a people, you have to get rid of all that negative view of Africa, that sort of self-loathing that he saw, that you have to embrace who you are, that you can't see your, see your race as being inferior, uh, you have to be empowered. And so for him, it was this idea of this triangulated um, shipping lanes, that he would sort of have these, these movements between Africa and America uh, and Jamaica, and to have these sort of these connections so that um, that African Americans could do for self, can be empowered. And so he started the Black Star Line, so the the White Star Line, which did the the Titanic. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted to do the Black Star Line, right? He wanted his own sort of black black enterprise to um, to sort of you know have so the black empowerment, black owned businesses, black empowerment to sort of see yourself empowered by that. And so as part of that too, even not seeing. That sort of idea of seeing these images of a white Jesus, that he made this case that, wait a minute, how African Americans view their divinity has a real impact on their psyche. And so if you don't see your God as as like you, that that's going to have a real impact on who you are. And so you see that Garvey identity, that connection back to Africa being really important for the Rastafarians who see the, the rise of Haile Selassie as a sort of marker of sort of the prophecy, that sort of the line of Judah is going back to Africa. So you see the emergence of Rastafarian culture embracing that. You see the Morris Science Temple and Noble Drew Ali saying, wait a minute, who are we? Our history has been stripped from us. And so who are we? Well, we're, the, we're this great Moorish empire that we descended from. We're Asiatics. We're not of African descent. Or the nation of Islam making this case that they need a separate black nation and that this whole narrative of the, the ancient tribe of Shabazz and the ways that races are created and this narrative of black superiority being really important. And so you sort of see this this rise of these movements. And so part of there's something about that idea that you have a true identity, but either it's been hidden from you or, or whites have acts, have taken actions to try to keep that from you because if whites knew who you truly were then they wouldn't be they wouldn't be able to contain you and so that's such a powerful dynamic that sort of question of that many immigrants come to america and they sort of lose their identity over time or choose not to identify with a sort of their their past culture from whatever country they came from in african american religious traditions it's really tricky when it's been taken from you it seems like in many cases it does leave this void and this desire of how are you going to feel how are you going to identify? What is your history if you don't have the necessary sort of historical documents to, to document? And for many, it's these, these really fascinating stories of these glorious pasts. And again, it's striking that there's no one ever has a kind of normal, like, I just have an ordinary past, right? It's always you're descended from <laughs> kings and from the queens. Right? No one's like, I'm, I'm descended from, you know, just some ordinary Joe or Josephine. And you know, it's not always glorious past. And so all these different traditions come up with an answer. Who are we? We are the kings and queens. We have this great history. They just don't want you to know about it. And that's the way they've tried to keep you down. Or for the Nation of Islam, you don't know what your last name, your true last name is. You only know your slaveholder's last name. So we'll put an X there for your last name as a marker to, uh, to denote that. And so that's really powerful dynamic of how, what you eat, how you dress, what you call yourself. All these markers are seen as really important to, to African American religious identity, and so all these groups come to some really creative understandings of what that what that means for them. It's so interesting to see the usability of the past, and I I kind of see these mirror opposite stories. There's the declension narrative where you're looking back to a pristine history. Uh, do you want to return to that? That there's also the opposite of that, which is the idea of uh, barbaric savagery, sort of like 
you know, back to Africa is these these people who are uncivilized who need to be to have civilization brought to them. And these competing uh, stories are just it plays out throughout the entire book, and I, 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 you know, and obviously beyond the book as well. But um, I think I think the people can get a taste uh, just based on the quick things you described there uh, of how many stories there are to be told in this introduction. Uh, so the book focuses intensely uh, on the point that there's no singular African-American or black religious story. What are some of the prominent areas that you'd like to see scholars look at currently? What are scholars looking at and what do you like to see in, in research in the field right now? Yeah, people are doing some some really great work today. I really appreciate your point. Yeah, because I always want to, you know, is this sort of look at these threads. Like, what do we do? Uh, because there's so many really great um, individual books. Um, Sylvester Johnson just came out a book on African American religion and colonialism and power. And um, as I mentioned, Al Rabato does slave religion, and there's some great. I should mention, too, um, Sylvester Johnson, he also just published a piece in the Mormon Studies Review uh, reviewing Paul Reeve's book on, on Mormonism and race and, and added a corrective to it with his colonization views. It was fa It's a fascinating piece. Yeah, he, he's a wonderful scholar. Yeah, I love Sylvester's work. Yeah, it's great. Uh, lots of great uh, sort of st studies of, of slave religion and – and and some and some on uh, sort of so individual stuff and new religious movements are on um, the nation of Islam, uh, and so there's lots of lots of great books. And so part of what I, I was trying to do, and again, it's so tricky when you write a book because then like Sylvester books come out and it's like you have to, <laughs> you know, all this great stuff keeps happening. But part of it is just to sort of say, well, uh, just sort of point towards what people, I think people are doing are sort of raising these questions. Uh, and so part of what well my hope is that they sort of keep exploring to sort of diversify what um, they're looking at and, and to tendency not to, I guess, to marginalize certain groups. So like these black new religious movements that I mentioned are often in the margins of narratives. And so it's often this focus on Christianity or sort of the, what the people consider mainstream traditions, which is really important for sure. But I think there's something about um, being really self-aware about how we're framing the mainstream and the margins that I think is really important that it's, well, why are these groups? Why is the story of Nation of Islam less important than uh, you know, black preaching in Georgia in the 19th century. Why, how do we make these kinds of decisions, which I think is really important. And I think even the markers that we do of, of with, like, so with, I sort of start with West African traditions and thinking about Africa as a way, as sort of the diversity of that. And it's part of what I try to do a little bit with the Herskitz and Frazier deb debate. And just say, you know, that, that why is Africa always sort of held constant? Like there's West African traditions and then how do they change over time? But how do, how do we move beyond sort of a static view of Africa and comparing the ways that Africans are either moving away from those traditions to sort of have a sort of an ongoing dynamic of what's happening in uh, West Africa and other parts of Africa that African Americans have come from in the slave trade. Uh, and I think in, in moving beyond the sort of civil rights period, I think that so many books end in the civil rights period as sort of Martin Luther King Jr., which again is important, right? The black civil rights movement, really important. But as Sylvester and others have looked at that, that religion continues to go on, right? There's a post-civil rights religious traditions as well. And so part of what I try to do is at least touch a little bit on Obama or a little bit on sort of African Americans and other world traditions. Just again, just to diversify, to sort of say that, and again, it's not all encompassing, but just sort of point to these sort of ongoing contemporary issues that are often in, you know, in sort of uh, don't necessarily make their ways into academic journals, maybe on, on um you know, people might give talks at conferences, but the way of sort of talking about how do we talk about African American religious life after the civil rights movement as well? Yeah, it kind of gets into black theology. I'm thinking um, you talked a little bit about James Cone, uh, who is a, a prominent theologian. You also talk a little bit about um, Jeremiah Wright, and people might remember that name from when Barack Obama was campaigning, and this was a pastor that had said things about 9-11 and other things that, that uh, his political opponents sort of fixated on and exploited a little bit, and I thought it was good to get some of the context that you added. Maybe take a second to talk a little bit about that. Talk for a minute about Jeremiah Wright and, and what people might um, learn about that, that, that they're not going to get in some simplified coverage on CNN or whatever. Right. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so you may remember back Jeremiah Wright, uh, Obama um, attended his church, and um, he had a, and again, part of his sermon, he had he'd sort of called America to account for some of the issues we talked about earlier um, in America and said some, you know, um, some work marked prior to uh, talking about America. And so people focused on that clip of, you know, he's disparaging America or he's not sort of totally pro-America. But it's really that dynamic we talked about earlier is how does 
how do African Americans who are clearly a part of the American history and a part of American culture, but how can you do that? Can you be patriotic and still sort of call out America on their promises if they're still not living up to them for, Af- for if the American dream is, doesn't seem applicable to African Americans? And so Jeremiah White during Obama's campaign made that statement about America. Uh, and again, part of it's that tricky dynamic, as you mentioned, black theology, going back to James Cone, and some would argue, you know, back to the slave ships uh, and back to West Africa, this idea of, of, of black preachers or religious leaders having a really important role in many African American religious communities of asserting what for people to be the voices of those who don't have a voice. And so for Jeremiah Wright is this sort of question, this sort of black prophetic tradition of calling America out that you have a religious responsibility if God's given you this this podium to not only advocate for yourself, but for advocate for all of your people. And so for Jeremiah Wright is to call America out is why is America not still living up to the promises of the American dream for many African Americans? And uh, and again, I was taken aback, and you sort of see that dynamic. And you can imagine, as you probably remember back, the, during a political campaign, you don't necessarily want to be calling America out on their, um, you know, their promises you know, to America. And so, I uh, so, so you see, um, you know, Obama sort of distanced himself from that, which you can sort of see that politically would be the case. But you also sort of see that dynamic of sort of again, I guess the early, you know, the our dynamic now where people just take a clip from that sermon. They're not playing the entire sermon, right? They're just giving you that clip. Yeah. And then, and so part of what I try to do is to frame that within the context of James Cone and others of many black Christians who just continue to struggle. Like for uh, James Cone talks about actually thinking about leaving Christianity because it just seemed like he was so disheartened about the way the white churches were dealing with race relations in the 1960s. He just couldn't see how can I be Christian and if, 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 if it doesn't have any impact on what's going to happen for African Americans, or how do we address these questions? And so his black theology is a way of, of talking about the ways that Jesus can sort of speak to uh, liberation theology, that, that it can be an empowering thing for African Americans, that Christianity and equality or Christianity and empowerment is not um, at odds with an African American experience. It actually speaks to that experience. But you also... Uh, so the Christian has that power, but you also need to call America out or call whatever context you're out. Um, that what well, that's what God prophets do in the Bible. They call out people if they're not living up to what God wants them to do or, um, wh- or what God wants for the people. And so you sort of see that trajectory. And so Jeremiah Wright clearly is part of that. But I think you also sort of see how those dynamics change that when you have that kind of forum, you have a 24 hour news cycle, you have someone running for president how that dynamic is really going to shift. And so people say, oh, wow, this is totally out of context. And part of what I was trying to do in the book is to say, wow, that is pretty dramatic. But wow, look at what black preachers have been doing for centuries. Like they've always been calling um, white institutions out or calling America out if he feels like they're doing, they're not living up to what God wants for his people in America. Yeah, it's a really useful way to contextualize it. Another thing that surprised me that I hadn't really looked at at all was domestic life. And this is something you've written in another book about. There's a book around the family altar, Domesticity in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Talk about that for a second, some of the tensions in black communities around family life. And it goes back to, I mentioned earlier about how women's gender roles were pretty restricted in many 19th century black churches. And so part of that question was, for me, that question about, well, why are black men doing this? Or how are women responding to this this sort of dynamic? And so part of what I looked at, I sort of looked at literature, looked at how people, if they said women should be a part of the home, I started looking at all this different domestic literature describing what the perfect black home should look like, how should how should people raise their children, where role, what's a good father look like, what's a good mother look like. And so part of what I saw developing in the 19th century was were many women, like Jarena Lee and others, who started saying, wait a minute. If, if women have this natural nurturing power and God has blessed them with this nurturing ability that men apparently don't have because they're masculine, they're men, they should be out in the world uh, you know, conquering business or industry or something, uh, that why are you trying to restrict our dynamic? Why should we restrict it to the Sunday school? If we have this naturally nurturing power that's greater than men, we should be the ones up front preaching and men should be nurtured in the pews. Right? And so I found this really, uh, again, sort of a similar dynamic of, of – slaves and Christianity of of many African-American women making this case, this, this, this ideology of domesticity saying, if we have this power, then we should be able to preach. If we have this spiritual gift, why are you restricting that gift? And to be able to frame it within a, you know, drawing on the Bible, drawing on uh, this religious context to make that argument. And so again, it took many years for women to actually get the 
uh, the ability to be preachers and then they hold their own pastorate. And then the AME Church, for example, only had their first bishop uh, a few years ago um, ordained. And so it's, it's definitely taken a while, but I guess I was really struck by this idea of taking a ideology that's meant to oppress you, like domesticity, keep you in the home, and many black women saying, this is actually why we should be doing missionary work. This is why our role should be expanded. And I found it to be a really fascinating and powerful argument that they were making in the 19th century. And there's just so much. I mean, we, we've only covered just a, a drop in the bucket uh, of the things that you cover in your book. How difficult was it to condense so much into one volume? Really difficult. As you mentioned, all these all these things we mentioned, I could have, you, people have written books on all this sort of stuff, right? Yeah. You serve on these things. I, but the idea was how can you – and many of it came out of, uh, you know, class I've taught African American religious history for many years now. And it would come out of questions a student asked me in class, class, or they'd just wrestle with this stuff. And I thought, you, there's got to be a way. I know it's to try to write a textbook is so difficult, but I thought, there's got to be a way to write one where it's just, it's about the questions. It's about raising the questions, having, giving some suggestions, but almost having a conversation with the reader. And I thought that'd be a pretty effective way to do it, because then it's not about cover. It doesn't cover everything. But I try to cover some central themes that at least keep that conversation going. So if someone was going to be reading it at home or going to be in a classroom reading it, that they could read a chapter with students and have some jumping off points for discussion. And so really difficult, but I'm, I'm really happy with it because I think it does, at least accomplishes that to go. It raises some interesting questions, I think. And so my hope is that it kind of keeps the conversation going. Do you have anything to say in conclusion, kind of personal reflection about how this project interacts with your own views on religion or your own experience in the academy? Sure. Yeah, this is uh, I, when I was becoming a religious studies major when I was undergraduate at Occidental College, I took a class on African-American religion. And it was all these really interesting questions that my professor, Professor Naylor at Occidental, will give him a plug. He was um, uh, just it was just I had never been in a context where people had would talk about religion historically and not necessarily from a particular point of view or advocating for, you know, you must believe this or something. Um, and so it was sort of out of that context that these questions, I've been thinking about this stuff for, for many years. And so for me, it really is this, it's something I've been trying to, wanting to do for a long time. And I was able to just sort of, over the years, just sort of put pieces together. And so, and again, trying to adapt with sort of changing scholarship, because just as you think, you, I got a sense of what the field is, it shifts again. So it's definitely uh, 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 in that context. But I hope that um, I really enjoyed writing it. I think it's um, I think it's really accessible. I think I wanted something that students could enjoy, people at home could enjoy. It's not necessarily a strictly academic um, uh, book, but it's really meant for people who are just, who are, I'm just curious about African American religious history. What is even African American religion? What is it? And so I sort of start with that question in the book, sort of think about what is it, we're what I'm talking about. And my hope is that you sort of get this sense of, wow, these really interesting groups, there's some really interesting stories there. And so my hope is that people go, wow, that's really interesting. I want to learn more about the Nation of Islam, or I want to learn more about West African religion, and we'll then sort of pursue that. So my hope is that it's sort of this jumping off point for people interested um, in different aspects of African American religious history. Thank you. That's, uh, that's Julius H. Bailey. He's a professor of religious studies at the University of Redlands in California. His books include Around the Family Altar, Domesticity in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And his latest book is what we talked about today. It's called Down in the Valley, an introduction to African-American religious history. And that's from Fortress Press. Julius, thanks so much for taking the time to talk about the book today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. 